Uh, Tony, would you please take over? Okay. Uh, now, um, in the, we've got five speakers uh, to speak for, for five minutes each in 20 minutes, he said ominously. So Dieter Lappel, who's Professor of Urban Economics, Hafen City University in Hamburg, perhaps you can do your, the first four minutes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was three very rich presentations. I just would like to focus on one crucial question. It's a relation between two different uh, urbanization models and social capital. And trying to link what Saskia and you, and you have explained. So uh, I would start with a paradox. We always have discussed that uh, Istanbul is the oldest urban age city, but it's also the youngest in some sense. So uh, we have to be aware that uh, in Istanbul, 1950, 1950, there was one million inhabitants. Today there are 14, 15, we don't know. So actually, in 50 years, they have founded a new city for 11, 12, 13 million people. And it is a success story. If you look at the urban age indices with density, with criminality, with the question of uh, fossil dependency, actually it's what we are trying to reinvent in our northern European cities. What is a success story? Actually, what we find is, I now will maybe polarize a little bit uh, the models, a model which you can characterize as a, as a bottom-up, community-based, informal urbanization, which is labeled here as Getchokondu development. The interesting thing is that the result have not been slums, as we do know them from, from Mumbai or from Sao Paulo. All the settlement have schools, have health care, and they succeeded for upgrading strategy. And they created intense multi-mixed structure with an integrated urban manufacturing. And uh, with a low carbon urban structure, it was a highly inclusive urbanization. And what's very important, it's a resilient structure, which was not heavily infected by the financial crisis. But we have seen there are problems. A key problem we always hear, you can't park your car. <laughs> and, you know, you have to take it very serious. When people are arguing like this, you have to find alternatives. And the second question you mentioned, the earthquake problem. Mm -hmm. So now we, this argumentation is linked with the second argumentation to, uh, to adapt, adapt the, the, the urban structure to the, to the demands of globalization. But when I understand rightly what Saskia is saying, that the capabilities for handling and enhancing network communication are crucial. There's a complementary structure. We have an interlink between global and local processes. This, this global networking needs this locally based social capital. And this is just what was produced. And now what is this new strategy? The new strategy is a developer-driven urbanism with an exclus exclusive urban structure highly dependent on car ownership, with a simulated cityness, you could say, with a fragmented, low-developed social capital, and actually all those things we want to overcome in the, in the cities of the north. So for me, that's a crucial point we are confronted with, and we have to find solutions. And how you can reconcile this heritage of this very successful development strategy with the new exigence of globalization, of sustainability, and so keeping up and developing social capital. So is there a, a possibility by a step-by-step -step improvement and not to fall back in the old mistakes we had in the North, the tabula rasa, the clearance of the old structure, destroying social capital, but really take it serious. The city is made of men and women and not out of stones. So you have to take it serious the linkages, the social linkages between the people and try to take the main asset, the social capital, and this has to be the basis for development strategies. Thank you.
Dieter, thank you for your brevity and indeed your passion. Um, our second discussant is Henk Ovink, who's director of the National Spatial, uh, of National Spatial, Spatial Planning, slower, at the Ministry of Housing, Spatial Planning and the Environment in the Netherlands. Henk. Thank you, Tony. Well, uh, passionate, Dieter, uh, as we know you. Uh, I would like to refer on uh, uh, two things. Saskia said, sorry, um, if Istanbul is this mobility hub, uh, uh, what does this mean uh, for Europe, uh, for the western, northern uh, parts of Europe? Um, if you look at the issues uh, at stake, it's always this confrontation between climate change uh, and migration, segregation, between mobility and quality of life, uh, between the social issues, etc. And the city, every city, we know that through the urban age, uh, but we also know that in practice, maximizes this confrontation. But we, it's hard for us, even on a national, especially on a national level, to handle that. So if cities maximize this confrontation, and this confrontation in this mobility situation we are here in Istanbul, uh, is maximum for Europe, what can we do with it? Uh, then there's a, a second level, um, and that's our re reaction to these problems. Climate change, we start to innovate. Eh? Of course, we address it as a problem, but it leads to innovation. But the financial crisis, uh, the political shift, the EU debate on immigration, open borders and religion, leads to protectionism. So we have two approaches to different problems, of course, but two approaches, and it's so crucial now in these times to try to have the same approach towards this financial crisis, the social problems, uh, the religious tasks, that we, uh, uh, the way we act upon it on climate change. So we have to innovate in that. And Istanbul, I don't know, perhaps they might lead us away. For that, we need to accept and exploit more our differences. On a national level in Europe, in the Northern Europe, uh, uh, as Dieter said, we tend to level things out. Uh, we don't like uh, differences. Uh, that leads to protectionism. So we have to overthrow this leveling uh, uh, and focus and exploit uh, differences. C cities catalyze these differences. And um, uh, my, my last would be, Europe is a shrinking continent. Uh, a shrinking. If you look at the whole world, there's Europe uh, and uh, the rest is growth. Although in the cities there's growth, but as a continent, not. Can Istanbul, Istanbul be the valve for Europe culturally, but also uh, demographically? And can we, as Europe countries, position Istanbul as a moving city in the Europe of tomorrow? Thank you, Hank. And uh, an interesting, introducing the idea of the risk of protectionism across a, a range of, uh, not normally just the financial way, but you're also talking about a much wider risk of protectionism. And I think that's uh, an important warning. Um, our third discussant, is Gerard Frug, another long-time long -time friend of the urban age, who's professor of law at Harvard University. I want to spend my four minutes talking about democracy. And of course, Turkey is a democracy, so is the United States. That's not the part that interests me. What interests me is this question. To what extent is the future of Istanbul in the hands of the residents and citizens of Istanbul? No one thinks that the future of Istanbul or of New York should solely be in the hands of the residents of the city. But the question is, to what extent do they have a voice? This is a question I bring to, I'm not an expert about the city, and I want to ask four specific questions. One, to what extent is the policy that's been described, the policy of globalization, a policy of the central government and not of the local desire? So uh, Professor Cater wants us to think that the collapse of the central and local is okay that they are actually in sync. What I wonder about is there another side, as he knows much better than I, 
the national government in Turkey has more than once abolished the local government in Istanbul and appointed an administrator and it said. There must be some desire in the people of Istanbul to have some voice of their own not the same as the central government. So the question number one would be what is the central local relationship uh, in the city? Two, how do we organize city government? To the extent we have a strong mayor, that makes a big difference. Now, Istanbul has an extremely interesting city council made up of the 30 some odd uh, district mayors and other representatives of the localities. This idea of knitting the whole city together from the local district municipalities is an incredibly innovative idea. No other urban aid city has this model. But if the city council is weak, it doesn't matter. What, if, it, if we have a strong mayor, and if we have a famously strong mayor in Istanbul like we do in New York, uh, if we have a strong mayor, the organization, the popular organization of the city council as a voice in the future of the city is thereby weakened. So the second question I bring to Istanbul is to what extent is the organization of the city government itself responsive to the city? The third question is to what extent is city policy being run by public corporations and not by the city government at all? We've already heard some about public corporations in the housing area, but there are actually dozens of public cor cor corporations running important services in Istanbul, just there as there are in New York and elsewhere around the world. And one of the questions, certainly in the United States, about these public corporations is, to what extent are they efforts to avoid democratic accountability? The fourth and final question is the question of privatization. What is the role of the private sector in the development of the city of Istanbul? We've heard something already about public-private partnerships. And when we hear about them, as we did today, it's always an upbeat, very positive, we really like these things. Now, I like them too. I think they're a very productive and positive uh, uh, in innovation. On the other hand, they have a dark side. And we also hear more about the dark side. One aspect of the dark side is that the private sector can have too much influence over government officials, more influence than the people of the city. I mean developers and real estate people. And the question is, is there a public-private partnership in the sense of private influence over city policy? Now, the strongest version of this, of course, is corruption. Corruption is an example of a public-private partnership, but it's not the usual example of public-private partnership <laughs> that uh, people raise. So all four of these things, to what extent is the policy central, to what extent is the policy mayoral, not council, to what extent the policy is corporate, to what extent is the policy private, are all questions about democracy in this city. Thank you, Gerald, and uh, for raising those four uh, key questions about governance and the relationship between the public and private in the delivery of government.